Hello, welcome again to Spink and another Coin podcast. Today, it is a pleasure for me to show you a selection of the Anglo-Saxon coins from the collection of Anglo-Saxon, Viking and Norman coins put together by a dedicated collector, Alan Williams, who has spent 40 years amassing a really interesting collection. This year we will be selling it a series of sales and to begin with the first sale we'll kick off with just a selection. We've chosen 100 of the best Anglo-Saxon pieces for the March auction. I've got them here in front of me and it's such a pleasure to look at 100 really nice, interesting, but also extremely good, high quality Anglo-Saxon coins. We've got the whole range. We've got the various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, starting with Kent, small kingdom down in the corner, um, centered on Canterbury, of course, where uh, Christianity first came to England. And their mint, not surprisingly, their main mint was at Canterbury. We've got the coinages of the archbishops of Canterbury as well. Um, after Kent, we can move into the middle of the country where we have the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia, big, important kingdom under their very strong king, Offa. Um, they're the smaller kingdoms in East Anglia, um, short reigned kings, but very important. Um, we will not deal with the Dane law and the Viking coinages. That will be for a later sale. And then, of course, we have Wessex, famous because perhaps of Alfred the Great, um, which leads us into the formulation of the Kingdom of All England, which the kings of Wessex um, gradually uh, became, and they assumed that title, the Kings of All England. No sooner had they done that, of course, than the Vikings returned. Poor old Ethelred II. And we have Canute and half a Canute. We have the House of Wessex coming back. And, of course, we end up, after Edward the Confessor, with Harold II, whose short reign ended at the Battle of Hastings, where, as we all know, more Northmen, but this time one generation removed, so they were now Norman. More Normans come across from France and finally conquer the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of England. And that is the end of Anglo-Saxon history, in one sense. So it's a fairly compact, say, 300 years, um, roughly 750 to 1066, three centuries of Anglo-Saxon civilization. And no matter what you heard about the Anglo-Saxons, they were not an uncivilized, hairy, ruthless bunch of thugs because they had a magnificent coinage. And any civilization that produces the quality, the consistent high quality of coinage that the Anglo-Saxons produced must have been a sophisticated and a successful civilization. They were a good trading nation, and that's why they had the store of wealth that they did. That's how they managed to produce so many silver pennies, because we weren't producing our own silver. So there was obviously a lot of trade. It was a wealthy country. That's why the Vikings were invading, and uh, that's why we were such a target for pirates and eventually for settlement um, from Scandinavia because it was a wealthy area. And the wealth is fully attested by this splendid collection of Anglo-Saxon coins. We can just pick a few, perhaps. They'll all be up on the website. And in fact, they're already all on display in the showroom, if you'd like to come in and look at them. All 100 are there, filling the whole wall. Um, with some enlarged photographs so you can really admire the detailed work. But we'll just look at a few this afternoon, because we can't possibly look at 100. 
And perhaps we should look at, why not, the most famous names. Let's look at Mercia, let's look at Offa, and let's look at Wessex and look at Alfred the Great. Um, perhaps right at the end we could have a little glance at poor old Harold II, uh, where the story ends. So to Mercia, the big central kingdom in the middle of England, with their strong king, um, and he had a very uh, interesting uh, coinage. He even put his wife, his queen, on the coinage, and we have a couple of those coins as well, which was exceptional in Anglo-Saxon times. So let's start with Offa. Why not? Um, Offa, king of the Mercians, and a fabulous coinage. Here we have some splendid examples, and they all have portraits. Now, are these accurate portraits? No, they're not. Um, they're stylized, and their model was probably a Roman coin or Roman coins, which the moneys would have had in front of them as examples, um, and they follow pretty much a set pattern. But having said that, they're so full of character, you would be very, very tempted to think, perhaps Offa really did look like this, um, which is a very sharp and a very pleasing portrait. Or perhaps he looked like this, which is rather a scruffy, ugly portrait. Or this third one, well here he looks like a Roman consul um, with his very pronounced uh, profile and his diadem. It doesn't matter. They're all superb little works of art. They're not hugely rare, they're scarce. Um, Alan Williams has assembled a wonderful group of them here. Um, what are rare? are the coins of Offa's wife, his queen, Sinifrith, here she is. And her title as Queen of Mercia is actually on the coinage, which is very interesting. So there's the coinage of Mercia under King Offa. His coinage uh, merged with the other kingdoms because inevitably he was um, always at war with his neighbors. Um, Offer, of course, is remembered for building the great rampart, the great earthworks between his kingdom and the uh, less friendly people to the west of him, known as Offer's Dyke. Now we can move on to, why not, Wessex, and of course the most famous Wessex king, Alfred, known as Alfred the Great. And again, portraits on his coins. But what contrasting portraits we have here. Uh, one, this chap, looks like he's got dreadlocks and a huge great nose. It's a fabulous interpretation of a portrait of Alfred. Um, but the other one, very close to the Roman prototype, very proper, and he's had a haircut. So very contrasting portraits. Here's a tiny one because although they're mostly pennies, there are a few half pennies. And this is a little half pence of Alfred. And here we have another contrasting style um, with a very decorated, um, almost brocade um, cloak that he's wearing. Quite beautiful. So lovely coinages of Alfred. Well worth your while, I think, to come in and have a look if you're in London. If not, look on the website. Um, they're all illustrated there. I could say something about the second life of these coins, um, which might be of interest. But before I say about that, I'll just bring out one by way of introduction. Here we go. Here's an Archbishop, Archbishop Wilfred of Canterbury. This coin was discovered in a field about 20 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago, and the farmer brought it in to us in London, and we put it into an auction. Um, I was at Christie's then, and it came up for auction, and it was purchased by a Canadian, so we sent it to Canada. When that Canadian's collection of works of art came back to London for sale, it went to Sotheby's. And so this coin came back from Canada. 
and it was purchased by Alan Williams. Alan Williams lives in Australia, so the coin was sent to Australia. Now Alan Williams is selling his collection, the coin has come back to London. This little penny of Wilfred, which sat in a field for 1,500 years, has travelled around the world twice in the last 20 years. Remarkable. And that's what I mean by the second life of coins. Because all these coins had a first life, sometimes a short life, because this coin did not circulate very much before it was dropped and lost. So it might have had an existence of a year. But when they're discovered again, and they go back into the collecting community, they start their second life. And we've got many coins here with histories in the last 200 years that are full of events. They are the subject of um, learned papers delivered before uh, societies. They get illustrated in books. Careful line engravings are done of them in the 19th century. They get into auctions, into famous collections. They get swapped. They get stolen. They get looked at. They get published. And eventually they end up in a collection like this. And you can trace back through the auctions over the years where these coins have been for the last 100 or 200 years. We've got several from very famous hoards that were discovered and recorded. Um, there was one hoard, for instance, in uh, Dorking. We have here a spink plate depicting the town of Dorking. Um, there was a big hoard of them discovered, um, I think it was 1817 in Dorking. There's even one hoard from Cornwall, which goes back into the 18th century. So some of these coins have a 200 or 250 year history, which is their second life. I think the second life of Anglo-Saxon coins is actually fascinating. Um, it would be a good, a good exhibition, um, a good subject for uh, discussion all by itself. And we'll finish with a penny of Harold II, the last of the Anglo-Saxon kings. Here's a very lovely example, quite a scarce one, from Stenning. The sale at the end of March, we have two days of sales, and there's a general sale as well as this one. Um, you're very welcome to come in and have a look. As I say, everything will be online. Um, if you've got some Anglo-Saxon pennies and you'd like to bring them in and show them to us, we'd be delighted to have a look at them as well. Uh, but if you're a serious collector, this is really an opportunity um, to buy some wonderful quality as well as rarity. There are many hundreds more, and they will be offered for sales in um, July and in September and even in December later on in the year. So gradually the whole collection will be dispersed. Anglo-Saxon this time. In the summer there will be Anglo-Saxon and also the Viking coinages. In the autumn we will have the Norman and into the anarchy under King Stephen. And eventually, by the end of the year, we will hope to have sold them all. So that's just a taster. Please come along and join in the fun. Thank you very much.